Good morning, good afternoon. Don't know what time of the day it is. And welcome to Differentiated Assessment, Learner-Centered Options to Maximize Understanding and Success. I am so excited to be here with you today. Um, it's just nice to be together. Even though we aren't together together, we're in a group, which is, is fun. So thanks for joining me today. My name is Sarah Goldhammer. I'm from the Southern Illinois Professional Development Center, part of the ICCB Professional Development Network. And um, here with me today are two of my colleagues from the Central Illinois Adult Education Service Center, Amber Fornaseri and Anita Kerr. So I thank them for being here. They are going to help you with tech support should you need some. Uh, but you do see on your screen where if you want to call in with, with your telephone, if you're having any trouble with audio, um, you can do that. And uh, But if you have issues, Anita or Amber will tr uh, do their best to help you. Um, also, I do want to let you know that there is a question box. So if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to raise those questions and I'll stop periodically, just kind of see where we are so that I make sure that I um, answer those. There are four handouts for you also on your control panel. So if anybody likes to have the PowerPoint to follow along, it's there for you. Um, there's also a couple of supporting handouts that I'll refer to as we go along. So those are there. Also, we have closed captioning and I put it on the top of the screen. So if you don't like, if enough people don't like it there and they'd rather have it at the bottom of the screen, let me know and we can move that because we do have that option. All right, so let's go ahead and giddy up and get started. Uh, one more housekeeping is to remember your professional development center that I already referenced is here to assist you. And we want to keep you apprised of all upcoming distance learning opportunities. So visit the Excellence in Adult Ed website. It's there for you. If you don't already have that bookmarked, you'll want to bookmark it because there are tons of great recorded webinars and other resources for you there. Um, also find us on Facebook or on Instagram and that's where you'll have a lot of announcements as well. Alrighty, so I think we should start this assessment session with a pre-assessment. What? Yes, we should definitely, but the, here's the catch on the assessment. It's not about what you know about assessment. I want to learn about you and how you like to be assessed, okay? So let me share with you what your options are gonna be. If I was assessing you, would you want a multiple choice test? Would you want a written essay? Do you wanna act it out? Build a diorama, one of my favorites. Give a presentation, write a song or rap and then perform it for us and perform an interpretive dance. Now I'm gonna put a poll up and you can vote, you only get to choose one, you might have more than one, just pick your top, your absolute top, okay? And um, let me bring that poll up. Hmm. All right. Now the last two, if you wanted to perform interpretive dance, you don't see it on there because um, this system won't only let me do five. So, sorry about that. Okay, quite a few of you have voted. Oh, nobody wants to build a diorama. I think I'm, I'm uh, painting the view by telling you that ahead of time. Okay. If you haven't voted, do it quickly because I'm going to close this and we're going to move on. Okay, so let's share this. And it looks like um, the majority of you liked a written multiple choice. Well, uh, but closely followed, you're tied actually with the written essay. Um, act it out, give a presentation, and you know, close or, or behind by quite a bit. But sounds like we like the essay. Okay, so we're gonna hide that. So let me ask you, as we go along, and just to clarify, so nobody freaks out, there isn't going to be a test today. There is going to be an application exercise, which will be your assessment, but it's not going to be a written test. Um, 
anything on this screen that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, like, oh my gosh, sir, don't make me do the interpretive dance. Or apparently build the diorama was pretty low on the scale as well. So let me see. Okay, great. Um, so here's my point. If you're having assessment, you need to make sure that you're capturing what somebody actually knows. And if we aren't assessing in a way that works for that particular individual, then we're probably not going to get the best results. Because you might say to me, Sarah, I know something, but if you make me build a diorama, I am not going, you're not going to get a clear picture of what I can do because that's not hit playing to my strengths. And um, if you're going to make me do an interpretive dance, that might be a problem as well. So although I have a whole bunch of teachers out there, and for many of you that multiple choice and written essay, which is very common, may feel good to you, our students may actually feel about those things like you feel about building a diorama. So we wanna keep that in mind. One more thing I wanna to mention to you as we think about kind of activating our brains and getting ready to think about how can we best meet the needs of our students and match what, what works for them, is how many of you in the last couple of months that in trying to meet the needs of your students and using lots of technology and just the new normal of our world, how many of you have felt uncomfortable? And I'm serious, what I want you to do now is I want you to leap to your feet and I want you to say, I did, Sarah. I felt uncomfortable because I think most of us did. If you didn't, that's fine. You stay in your seat and be comfortable. But I think for most of us, yes, we felt uncomfortable. Why? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but just at the kind of the, the core of it is we were asked to do a lot of things and maybe learn at a very quick pace things that um, made us feel uncomfortable because like, I'm not very good at that. So, and I've had teachers say to me over the last couple of months, Sarah, I'm a really good teacher and I have all these teacher tool, tools in my the teacher tool belt, but I'm struggling with the technology. And unfortunately, even if I was good at one part, if I couldn't do the other part, then I was gonna get a poor assessment. I was going to get a pure, poor vic picture of what somebody actually could do. So again, keep those in mind as we're thinking about options for our students. One other thing I want to do before we launch into this um, is if you have a pad of paper, a scrap paper, an old envelope, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but I would love for you to prepare to note a few items. And so you can do that however you want because I'm all about options and choices. So you can write it down, you can put it on your computer screen, you can pick up your cell phone and put it on your notepad on there. Um, and if you're the type of person that really just likes to keep it in your head, you can do that also. Um, you can tell the dog that's sitting next to you what you wanna remember, because oftentimes saying something out loud will help you to remember it. But I want you to be primed and ready for a couple of things. And the first thing I want you to write down or note in however you wanna note it is the word choices. How can we make sure that we provide choices? And let's move on. So goals for today, because we need, if we don't know where we're going, how are we gonna get there? So I want by the end of this time for everybody, and I'm sure there's a wide range of different people that are very used to using differentiated instruction assessment, people that are new to it and everywhere in between. But I wanna make sure that everybody can describe the concept for differentiated assessment. That they can identify, identify benefits of differentiated assessment for both ourselves and for our students, because if there's no benefit, why do it, right? So what are they identified? Be able to explain to your students why you're providing choices for them and why it's important. And because part of differentiating is we wanna make sure that they can advocate for themselves to ask for those same types of differentiations in other settings. Also to your colleagues, the benefits of differentiating, uh, differentiating assessments. So for some of you, I have a higher goal. I'm hoping that some of you can convince your colleagues that this is worthy and that it is going to help them and their students, but at least be able to explain it. 
Create one differentiated assessment for your classroom, and that's heads up, you guys, that's gonna be your assessment at the end, is I'm gonna ask you to create something that you're gonna take back and use, that application piece. And then I have a couple of other goals um, for today. I'm hoping that you'll, oh, oh, I did add this in at the last minute, I forgot. I added in, identify one remote learning resource you will continue to use on the other side. And I don't know what the other side means. I just mean for the future. I know that all of us out there have learned so much and grown so much over the last three months. I would hate to think that we would just go back to exactly the way we were before. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to be in a room with you right now. But what is good that we have learned and then how can we take it so the other side's even better when we are with our students and i'll give you some examples of that as we go along so i want you to and then here's the part that i want to make sure that today at least once you gasp like <gasps> not gasp for air once you laugh and once you nod your head in agreement so those are my own personal goals of what i want to accomplish with you all right some of the names of the people that are attending today, I know have been through the special learning needs presentation. And if you have, you've seen this before because you know this is one of my favorite all time cartoons. This and one other random far side is for a fair, fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So there you go. Um, obviously that fish is not gonna do very well on this exam, on this assessment, right? Obviously the elephant is not gonna do very well on this exam. Does that mean that they don't have value? Obviously not. So for some of our students, being able to fairly uh, give them the type, right type of assessment is gonna make all the difference. It's gonna make the difference between them being successful and not successful. All right, so I have a trick question for you today. You're like, great, love the trick question. What do you teach? So I'd love, like for you just to type that in the question box at the bottom. I'm gonna take a look. Anybody, what do you teach? ESL, math and science, ABE, Another ESL, ESL, okay, all right. A lot of ESL, marvelous. Here is the uh, trick question part of it. Thank you for, for sharing and don't be mad at me, but the answer that I'm really looking for today is that we teach people. And of course we teach content to people. I'm not discounting that and, I, and the content's very important. But I want to keep in mind as we, you know, activate your brain to think about the fact that it's the human aspect of what we're teaching. So these are our actual adult ed students from Lincoln Land, by the way, because here's a quote for you, learning happens in us, not to us. Learning happens in us, not to us. So the first reflection that I wanted you to note was choices. The second one is the answer to this question for yourself. What does that statement mean for us as teachers? And I'm really, I'm gonna shut up for a minute because I want you to reflect on that. If you're sitting with someone or just say it out loud to whomever, to the dog, to the cat, to the gerbil, whatever, to the fish. And I did have one person who said they'd rather have the captions at the bottom. So I am gonna move them. So I only had one vote um, while you're writing that. Okay, so hopefully that makes you think about, you know, the reflection of that we really do need to meet each student where he or she is and be able to move them forward. That, um, that, that that's important, that should be a goal for us. So, and why should it be a goal for us? Because variability matters. The shoe on the screen tells you why variability matters. The shoe industry for a long time has designed for variability. This particular shoe on the screen happens to be a size eight and a half men's shoe. Just happens to be, I'm telling you, just believe me it is. So I want to think about how many of you does that work for? If I'm gonna gift you a pair of eight and a half for you personally, are you, does that work for you? Are you a size men's eight and a half? And there's probably a few of you that are, 
but the vast majority of us probably are not. So those shoes really don't work for us. There's nothing wrong with the shoe and there's nothing wrong with me, but we just don't meet in the middle. And I wanna give credit to Todd Rose from CAS, the Center for Applied Special Technology. He's the one who shared with me the first time this example that I'm using today. So to play out that variability matters in shoe size, this is Usain Bolt. For a long time, he was the fastest human on the planet. I'm not sure if he still is or not, but he's still doggone fast. And he happens to wear a size 13 men's shoe. So Usain has, Usain, because you know, we're close personal friends, I'm gonna call him Usain. Um, he has a potential for running, a high potential, we happen to know, but he has potential. But if we gave him a size eight and a half pair of shoes, he would either, I don't even know if he could physically stuff his feet into that. So he might have to run barefooted. And if he could stuff it in, either way, it's going to greatly diminish his ability for success because variability matters. And for our students as well, how we share information with them, the representation, and then how we assess them is going to make a difference in their success level. Again, credit Todd Rose from CAST. So let's talk about differentiated instruction, differentiated assessment. We're going to kind of move through and then have some application for our classrooms. So differentiated instruction is a way of thinking about teaching and learning. So I want to make that, I really want you to think about it globally. It's not just a bunch of strategies, which strategies are important, just like content's important, but it is a way of thinking about uh, teaching and learning. So again, I want you to, to imagine if you have been doing some differentiation, I want you to think about how else could I do it? What else could I add? And I wanna make the point also that what we're learning today doesn't replace what you're doing. You already have a lot of great tools that you're using as a teacher. This is another way of thinking to provide an enhancement, an expansion of what you're already doing. So for those of you who have been differentiated, I want you to think of what's a new way. And for those of you who haven't been, my goal is that you have one way whenever we finish up this. Yikes, I came in thinking that um, it would be quiet here and there's people on campus who would have thought that. Okay, shut the door. Differentiation is not new, just in case you think it's some trendy new thing, it's not. And here's my evidence of how it's not new. I would be very surprised if anybody on this webinar knows where far Missouri is. If you, all, if you do, please let me know because I'd love to know how you know that. Uh, but that's where I grew up very rural, southeast Missouri. I grew up on a dairy farm and that's how you get to FAR and that's pretty much what most of FAR looks like is that open ground you see there. And this is where I went to school, first through eighth grade. And it was such a small school that um, the classes, the grades were combined in rooms. So kind of like adult ed, there was a lot of multi-level classrooms, even though it wasn't necessarily supposed to be. So first and second were great, grades were together, third and fourth and so, so on. So you can imagine there were a lot of different levels that were happening. And so I remember having some really wonderful teachers way back then, um, and they differentiated and they allowed for a lot of time for individual reflection, a lot of time for us to decide even how we were going to show them that we know what they want us to know. So let's talk about that some more. So what is differentiation? Let me read a couple of things and then we're gonna circle some that I wanna highlight again. So differentiation is a sequence of common sense decisions made by teachers with a student first orientation. It's um, a way of thinking about teaching and learning, a model that guides instructional planning in response to students' needs and an approach that helps educators tailor their teaching so that all students, regardless of their ability, can learn the classroom material. So student-first orientation, it's thinking about students as people, about learners, and thinking about what their needs are. It's a response to students' needs and all students. So those are the key takeaways from that. So why should we do it? I gave you already that analogy about being uncomfortable and technology. Here's another one that um, 
might make you uncomfortable as well. It's shopping for jeans. Shopping for jeans is like just right under shopping for a swimsuit for me. It's, it's, it's stressful. Okay. So if I went into a jean store or if you went into a jean store and all they had was one type of jeans for one type of body, and maybe all they had was skinny jeans, and they didn't have any relaxed fit jeans, and they didn't have any tall girl jeans, which I personally don't need, but my daughter does, so I appreciate tall girl jeans, or you know, different types of jeans, there's only one way, then I probably wouldn't get my needs met. I probably wouldn't find something that works for me unless I just happen to be the right fit for that particular type of jeans. And here's the thing, for our students, not only do we need to have different types for different students, sometimes we need different types of assessments for different, for the same student, for different days or for different times or for different subjects. One thing that might work um, well for one subject may not for another. At the beginning, I shared with you, you know, the, the poll of how would you like to be assessed. I had a professor in college long, long time ago who the final exam was, and this was a small enough class that he could do this. We had to make an appointment with him and come in and sit down and he only had one question, you know, high level, senior level class, one question. Seems like a really easy final exam, right? Cool. The question was, what did you learn in this class in this semester? Wow. Um, so I will tell you that played right up to me. I'm like, oh, okay, I got a whole bunch of things to tell you. You eventually told me to leave and get out of here because you didn't want me to keep talking. So that might work really well for me in a certain topic and it may not in another topic. So it's kind of my example of we want to differentiate not only just for different students, but for within the same student for different days and different topics. So again, effective teachers strategically select an appropriate assessment tool for each learning situation. So think of it like a carpenter choosing a hammer to drive a nail or a saw to cut a board. A teacher chooses that right tool for the purpose. So hopefully we'll get some new tools today. So rich data is gathered using a wide variety of instrument, um, ins instruments and that allows students to show what they know in more than one way. And I would also make the case at this point that not only does it show that the student knows it in more than one way, when you differentiate assessment, you gauge, you, you get more interest, but you also get a clearer picture of what the student actually knows. Because it's kind of like if you um, have an event happening and you have cameras from all angles and you can see it from all angles, it's amazing what you learn if you have different angles, as opposed to if you only see it from one perspective. And for our students as well, if they need to show you in multiple ways what they know, it's going to change the richness of the data that you're going to gather. So it takes more than one form of assessment or more than one tool to gauge individual learning. And this is adapted from Differentiated Assessment Strategies by Carolyn Chapman and Rita King. So I wanna give a, a, a shout out to them. So again, kind of driving home that why differentiate and to capitalize on that more than different view. If you have a student give you an answer, a, a verbal answer, that's one type of assessment. It's an informal assessment. And maybe they take an essay test. That's another type of assessment. And maybe they build you that diorama. That's another assessment. And maybe they do the interpretive dance or maybe they do a multiple choice test. Um, you know, or some other way. So when all of those pieces come together, it's not one thing, but it builds into a beautiful mosaic. All the pieces come together so you can really see how your student understands. And here's the other thing about differentiated assessment. By getting a clearer picture, you might also be able to really pinpoint where they are not understanding. So it's not just to show mastery, but also to inform instruction so that we really understand. Um, you might seem like, you know, you've got some students who can write a good game or maybe they're good guessers, but if you give them multiple assessments, they're going to give you a clearer picture of where they really know and what they don't know. All right, so I'm gonna take just a minute
because I told you that I wanted you to take note, notes. So let's see, we had choices, we had um, differentiations, not new, we had the learning happens in us, not to us. I want you to think to yourself at this point, what is one thing that you've already thought about? And maybe it's something you knew already. I'm not saying I taught it to you, but something that popped into your head as a really important concept. Jot that down, make a mental note of it before we go on. Okay, now we need to move on. So develop an environment that invites people to learn, right? Um, and that's from Carol Ann Tomlinson from the Differentiated Classroom. Think about, is my classroom an inviting place to learn? Is it a place that I want to be, that my students want to be, that they feel engaged? So differentiation typically entails modifications to practice or delivery, process and design, products, kinds of works, content and materials, assessment to measure what students have learned, and grouping or arranged pairs. Again, for those of you who've been in education for a while, this isn't new stuff, right? So you have probably learned about many of those. We're going to focus today for the next few minutes about assessment and also products. What are the ways that the student can express or create for you to show you that they know? So it, differentiation is authentic assessment. It applies to real life situations. It's a multiple skills and a task, it's ongoing. And I think that's important also to realize is that assessment, generally a one-time shot is not the best type of assessment tool, but it's on, you know, ongoing and it's related to each other hands on activities, demonstrations of abilities to apply information and reflects growth in a skill or ability. So what it is, it is student focused. If you look there towards the bottom, it says student focused. It's at the core of quality teaching over in the bottom right hand corner. It is purposeful, purposeful use of flexible grouping. Use whole group, small group and individual tasks based on content and student needs. It's patterns of student needs. What it's not, it's not dumbing down. It's not incompatible with standards. It's not something extra on top of good teaching. It is good teaching. And it's not for students who have learning challenges and it's not just for students who are gifted. It's for all students. So it is appropriate ongoing assessment keeps the learner on track in the learner in, on the learning journey. And I love that thought also because I am very non-directional. So my GPS helps me a lot. And sometimes my GPS says to me, hmm, you screwed up, you went the wrong way, but then it helps me get back on track. And having ongoing differentiated assessment helps keep students on track in their learner, learning journey. Okay, again, I said I have, I know from looking at the attendees out there that we have quite a few um, special learning needs individuals. So again, you've seen the learning circle before, but I'm going to do it again today. And I'm gonna mention that one of the handouts is all the talking points for the learning circle, why you should do this. I love to do this with learners because it empowers them. It helps them understand how they learn. And um, sometimes I've had students who said, oh, well, I'm not dumb. I'm just not getting it in, in the way that works for me, which makes all the difference in the world because it empowers them then. So I will tell you that generally speaking, I love to do this with markers. I have smelly markers and I like to write all over. Um, we have a large enough group that I chose to not do it the way that I did it. Um, I have done this from a distance and I've done it on the screen and annotated it as people gave me the answers, but that was with a much smaller group. So I decided for today, I'm gonna to be less interactive, which I hate, I really hate, but I hope that you will interact with me, um, even though we are a little bit restricted because you, so that doesn't keep you from shouting out the answers. So please physically, and I mean this with all sincerity, I want you to shout out the answers, okay? Again, tell your dog what the answer is. So this is the learning circle and the orange arrows going in shows that we're taking in information, we're inputting information from the outside all the time. So what's one way that you are getting information right now? Okay, shout it out. Uh-huh, pretty sure I heard somebody say C. You're seeing it, you're looking at it on the screen, right? What's another way? So in the classroom, a lot of times our students see what else do we do 
to input information for our students. Yep, we hear it. Okay, so those are the most common is seeing and hearing, but there's other ways that we input. We also touch, ooh, that's hot, ooh, that's sharp, ooh, that, you know, that hurts. Um, so the, the sense of touch, you know, you've got those tactile students who want to touch everything. Um, through smell, it's underrated, but we do learn a lot through smell, maybe not as much in the adult ed classroom, although that's just a rabbit hole I'm not going to go down for right now because we only have an hour. Taste. Oh, that's bitter. Maybe we smelled it and it smelled bad and now it's bitter. Yep, that's bad. And then the last one is a little more abstract, but also for feelings and emotions. So if I asked you to think about, and I am asking you to think about, not just if I did, what's the best day of your life? What was the best opportunity of your life? And I want you to think about it. And you probably can remember all kinds of things about that day. Uh, what the weather was like, maybe even what you ate, what you were wearing, who you were with. But if I asked you about um, last week, Tuesday, chances are you wouldn't remember what you ate or probably even what you wore, unless you're one of those people, you know, stay at home that's just wearing the same thing every day which could be a whole nother issue. We'll talk about that later. You can stay on and I'll, I'll work you through that later. Um, but feelings and emotions are very important in how our memory and learning, and that's called input. So we wanna make sure that we give students lots of different types of input. And then inside of our brain, there's processing. All that information that's coming in, we're thinking about it in our gray matter. And little known fact, but there is that little memory closet there on your screen. You may or may not have known that there's a memory closet, but it's just a metaphor. Um, anyway, when you're inputting, you see those little hangers? You're going to, um, let's see, what's it called? the hangers here. That information is going to go there and hang there precariously unless you do something with it. So if you um, don't rehearse it, if you don't attach it to something else, if then you're probably not going to um, uh, keep that information, it's going to fall down into this trash can that's in your memory closet. That's why you can meet somebody, they tell you your name, and 10 seconds later, you don't remember what their name is, okay? Mm -hmm. But if we rehearse it and recall it and retrieve it often, it's going to go up here to our storage boxes, and that's where we keep information. Again, we don't really have storage boxes, but that's why sometimes you have students that you ask a question and they don't they they don't know the answer, and then you've gone on, you've talked about a whole bunch of other stuff, and 20 minutes later they go, oh oh I I I know now I know now they've been looking at all those boxes, so that's part of why um, processing a processing disorder can be very difficult because it's not that you can't remember it, but because it is mislabeled somewhere in your brain. All right. Now that I freaked everybody out about what kind of stuff, whoops, that they have going on in their brain. Um, all right, so we have inputting, we have processing, and then we have, I need to, then we also have output, okay? So again, shout out the answers. How do you have your students output? How do they, how do you know that they know what you want them to know? And I already put the first answer up there. Go ahead and shout it out anyway. They're gonna tell you, right? They're also, you might have them write it. Those are the two most common in most classrooms of assessments is they tell you and they write it. But you also could have them act it out, role play. And that truly is one of my favorite all time. I love to have students get up and move around. You have those students who want to be active. Let them be active in a way that works for you. Doesn't mean that it could just be chaos, but let them get up because then they're gonna be teaching other students. So when we're thinking about different potential assessments that we could give to students, acting out and role play is one of them. We can even do that from a distance. That's something that possibly we could take from this shutdown period is if they uh, record themselves 
telling you and they record themselves doing a little video and they can share that. So now I realize that some students may not be at that technology area. We're just brainstorming now of different possibilities, but act it out, role play. Um, singing or rapping, I've had students who are way more talented than me, which isn't really saying a whole lot, but I've had some very talented students who, you know, having that rhythm will make a big difference. So why do they have to give it an essay? Can they put it in a song? Uh, draw a picture, again, if they have art skills, let them draw it. Or that old interpretive dance, which I know you're laughing about, but there's going to be at least one student. And if you're thinking, Sarah, I don't know what my students want to do, and they're going to think I'm crazy if I tell them that they need that you know they can do these different things. No, they're not. Ask them what works for them. Ask them to share with you what feels comfortable. You know how, like you said, you felt uncomfortable before, um, in, with certain settings. For some of our students. Doing things the traditional way is the uncomfortable thing. All right. So two things we have to keep in mind in all of this is that we need to have someone, to, in order for someone to learn, they have to have their attention and we need to pay attention to environment. So if they are too hot, too cold, too hungry, too stressed, too tired, they're not gonna be able to learn. Here's one of the good news about teaching remotely. Um, and I'd be very curious to see if any of you have experienced this. I know that there's potential tech issues, but for some of our students, being able to be in another place and not be in the classroom actually is more comfortable for them. Oftentimes that student who is distracted by all the noise and you ask a question and you have all these different people saying things, it's that student who just is processing allowing them to have all those other students muted and let them think a little bit is actually going to help them so this is one of the places that i want to ask you when we come out on the other side whatever that looks like however you define that is how are you going to make sure that it's still okay for that student that student who had a hard time paying attention or processing with all the noise you know maybe they're maybe sometimes they can log in remotely and that's a program decision but Let's, let's talk about that. Uh, maybe they can wear headphones. Maybe they can sit someplace else. Maybe they can do things differently. And maybe instead of, and here's a crazy one, but I'm telling you, you have at least one student who's probably going to think this is a good idea. So let me throw it out there to you. You have, maybe they were texting you um, information, answers to things, or maybe they were putting it in the chat for your classroom, whatever you were using, whatever format you were using. So let them still do that. Whatever uh, system you were using, if you're using your mind and they were texting you things, if they want to text, let them keep texting you. Even if they're sitting right over there, there's no problem with them sending you something. Um, and like I said, some people might think that's crazy, but there's that one student who's going to like that and they're actually going to be engaged because they have a secret dialogue with you, a way to, um, to interact with you. It's different. Okay. So we want to make sure that we allow for all kinds of output, all kinds of output, all kinds of output. And again, if you're not thinking of other ways, we're going to get to that in a minute. We really are. Yes, we really are. Um, then I want you just to, to brainstorm with your students also. Let them help you figure out a way that, they, that works for them. Okay. So the term assessment refers to a wide variety of methods or tools that educators use to evaluate, measure, and document academic readiness, learning progress, skill acquisition, or educational needs of students. So we want to make sure that it's ongoing, as I mentioned, improves learning quality, provides feedback, and it's process-oriented. So again, thinking about how our students respond to us is part of the way that's a very informative um, informative and formative assessment piece is letting them tell you or ask questions or those types of things. It, it, it informs us. So we want to make sure we think about how do we ask our questions and how do they get to answer the questions. So remember before we talked about differentiated assessment examples, right? So I'm going to pause again for just a minute. 
and let you think about, is there anything on this list? And don't pick the first two because I know you're already doing the first two, right? And you guys already said that's how you like to be assessed. So I'm not saying those aren't good ways. They are good ways, but I'm saying they're already going on. Let's do something different. Let's offer choices and offer something different. So what is something on that list or something off outside of that list that you could start doing to help your students to give a different type of assessment for them? And I'll be quiet. All right, hopefully you came up with a few. We're gonna have you share in a little bit. But let's move on and think about assessment examples in the world. And I originally had the real world, but that makes me crazy because I think that um, the classroom is the real world, right? But I'm thinking daily living, work in our neighborhoods. What types of assessments do we get? Do we have multiple choice a lot in life? Do we have written essay? Do we, any of these? Okay, James Harden, for those of you who don't know, um, he's saying no. I don't know what you all are saying, so I'd like to hear you, shout it out. Do we use these types of assessments? Unless you're a singer, unless you're an actor, unless you happen to be an educational trainer, um, you probably, and, and teachers do do presentations more, but for the rest of us outside of education, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm one of you, so it's not the rest of us. It's those people out there. Um, are they using these? All right, so what can we do? What would be examples of differentiated assessment for the world? because I wanna throw those in the mix of some ideas for our classroom. So if you have an idea, go ahead and put it in the question box. I know it's not a question, you're answering a question, but um, funny, okay. We got some funny people in here, so. Um, so or make something, so create would be an answer. Uh, body language, show and tell, making an explanation for sure. Design or build something, absolutely. Creating a social media post about a topic, yes. Those are all ways um, that they could be assessments. I have some additional ideas for you. And what about solving problems? I know that sounds very abstract, but making sure that our students understand that when they're solving problems that is a form of assessment and that is going to be very beneficial in life efficiency and productivity customer relations and i'm going to make that a little bit broader human relations getting along with people asking good questions questioning is part of assessment because you have to understand instead of just tell me what you know, or I'm asking good clarifying questions as part of assessment. And being a good team member, collaboration, all real world assessments. Oh, I said real world again, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so let's think about this for our classrooms. And here's your assignment, there's gonna be two assignments. Here's the first one. So if you have somebody that you can have an actual conversation with, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, I want you to jot a few things down and then I want you to have a conversation with a colleague. And hopefully this is part of the convincing colleagues to be a little more um, uh, larger thinking in their uh, assessment options. So I want you to pick a content, like do you want your student to work on solving problems, on efficiency and productivity, on customer relations, asking good questions, collaboration, or another. If you came up with something else, feel free to use that. And then I want you to think about a process and a grouping. Remember we had all those that 
So is this going to be a group project? Is it going to be individual? Is it going to be research? Um, what are you going to do in order to work on this particular assessment? So here's the thing. You already have a topic that you're teaching. What I want you to expand that topic, I don't want you to throw that topic out, but I want you to think about um, what are some, some content that you can use with that, like show them how they might solve a problem using that particular information that you're already teaching in class. So a process maybe that you're teaching in class, where could you apply that in life in order to help you as well? And I'm thinking math, there's tons of ways that you could do that. Or how could you take that information and apply it to human relationships? How could you take that information and apply it to collaborations or to questioning? Okay, so I'm gonna be quiet for just a minute again. And I want you to think about how can I take this and apply this to what I'm already teaching and expand it for some options for assessment. Okay, if you have an idea, because we do have a few minutes, I would like to um, open up, you can, we can either un, un, unmute you on your mic or uh, put it in the question box. But what's something, and here's the thing, if you don't know, feel free to say, here's what I'm teaching. Help me figure out a way to apply this to what I'm teaching. And I will tell you also, as you're thinking and as you're writing, um, if I was doing this in a, a smaller platform, I would put you together in breakout rooms and let you talk about it a little bit. So I do realize that we lose that in this particular, in modeling, that's what I would normally do. So I will tell you that. Um, oh, okay, they can work together to make a family tree. Somebody put. And Patty, you had on originally design or build something. So that's another way that um, if you are designing and build something, there might be that efficiency and productivity could be a part of that. The discussion of how, okay, you built a prototype. Now, how do you become more efficient at what you're working on? Um, or if you um, um, run into a problem, how do you solve that problem? Where can you go to get more uh, materials? What if it costs too much? Um, all of those are different ways that you can think about um, those types of productivity and, and um, good questions and problem solving. And you can do that through collaboration. And here's the thing about all of these pieces also. If you are using any of those, please be explicit to your students that this is why you're doing it. Because in the world of work, the, this is what um, employers want to see. They want to see people that can solve problems. And I, I like to tell students also is not only is good problem solving part of what is going to get you hired, it's also what's going to get you promoted. Because our students need to hear about that part of life. Okay, let's see, what else do we have? Okay, you know what, Anita? Go ahead and tell people that. What, Anita had a suggestion, so unmute yourself and share. Sure. Uh, actually, I had just seen uh, somebody asked a question in the chat about using questions, and I uh, was teaching scientific method last semester, and instead of just using multiple choice questions, I think I would love to show students uh, a written example of a scientific experiment, and then instead of asking them questions, I would put them in pairs and make them write questions to try to, what questions should we ask about this experiment to show whether this experiment was accurate, reliable, dependable, et cetera. Instead of me asking, let the students ask the questions about the experiment. I, I think, I wish I had tried that now. When you can, next time. 
right? Um, and then can I just add on to what you said, that's a beautiful example is making sure that students understand the value of asking questions and where else they can do it in life because assessing ourselves is part of that process as well. So asking questions is helpful in a classroom, but then asking good, um, like, can you, and, I, and let me give you a, a, a world life, a real life example. Um, we see a lot of information out there, right? People post stuff, there's things on the internet. So by teaching students to really question, you help them to deduce and to analyze information and to make those examples in the classroom, but show them that that is important for them to do in um, the, the world as well. Okay, and a couple, I got to get caught up. Um, somebody says, Bloom's taxonomy questions, discuss a video conference app. Um, Patty said, what are the parts of machines and why they work? Uh, some on hand, experiment. I love, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with simple machines and then show them where they are in, in life. Uh, have a student present their expertise and work with the group to teach them that and have them report parts of their expertise. Thank you, Joan. Um, thank you, very good. Great answers, you guys. And let me see, let me take a look at the attendees and see if there was anybody who wanted to be unmuted. If you do, if you want to talk, if you, you don't like to type things in, then I want to make sure that you have the option, option to talk. Okay, I don't see anybody else, so we're gonna go on. So, again, output. Think about choices. Think about learning, learning works in us, happens in us, not to us. And how do our students wanna output? How can we allow them? And just a neatest example of turning the tables a little bit. I'm not gonna ask the questions, you ask the questions to me. And then talk about figuring out how, you know, how can you get the information that you want? Okay, so differentiated assessment also helps us and supports the four C's. And this is from the P21, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning. The four C's are creative, critical thinker, collaborator, and effective communicator. Those are the important C's for the future. So when we, the different outputs that we talked about, the different things that we, examples that we gave, many of them very creative. Students get to show their creativity. And sometimes the students will understand something if you allow them a creative outlet, a way to do it, um, as opposed to writing it on a piece of paper. And let me just mention also, um, if uh, there's a standard that addresses writing and you're thinking, okay, but I've got to address the standard, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm saying allow for other ways on the journey to being able to write that. Because if you are not a strong writer, going directly to writing may be very difficult, but if you allow me to have um, ways to work through this, some other ways to reflect on it, some other questioning, now I'm ready to get there. Um, being able to communicate, being able to talk, allowing for more than just giving a short answer, but maybe getting up and communicating as a, give a speech, um, collaborating. And then we've also talked about uh, critical thinking or um, problem solving. Okay. All right, you guys, we have just about fast, uh, turned the last turn into the home stretch. So I want you to do one more thing for me before we finish up today. I want you to think about your classroom assessments and I want you to either jot down one or again, leap to your feet and tell me a classroom assessment that you're currently using. Jot it down, say it out loud, tell the dog what's a classroom assessment. And now, after that, I want you to think about what's the world assessment? How are you going to tweak that assessment to bring in some problem solving, some questioning, some um, collaboration? How can you expand that assessment 
to make it a world assessment? How can you expand it to differentiate it and make it work for your student? Okay. I would love to hear from you. I'm going to give you my contact information. If you at the end of this go, Sarah, I don't get it. That's fine. I would love to hear from you and let's take your example when we have more time and let's think about how we could differentiate it if the thoughts didn't come to you today. And we can work through that. So excellence in education is when we do everything that we can to make sure that they become everything that they can. Don't make fish climb a tree. If they have a strength in an area, let's play to their strength and let's let them try it. And um, Anita talked about students being in groups. Students learning from each other is a strong, positive way to set up your classroom. So that grouping or sharing, someone mentioned in the chat about having someone who has an expertise teach others all really, really strong ways. And the, um, okay, great, thank you. Um, so that's, whoops, pretty much it for today. But I do want you to commit to one thing that you're gonna do. Maybe it's just offering choices. I shouldn't put the word just in it because that's a huge thing. Offering choices is very helpful. Ha ask your students how they would like for, you know, what can they do that they want to show you because you have to know your students. All right, so speaking of choices, there are tons of choices for you on the Excellence in Adult Ed website. There's all kinds of resources for you. There are many recorded webinars of different resources for you. There's um, resources to get you started in distance learning. There's discussion boards and so on. And to request a mentor there if you want one. We've had a lot of teachers step up and help each other, which I really appreciate. There's the Gmail account for the PDN. So please send a request if you need something. And let's see, let's go, oops. So I do wanna say at the end, thanks for all that you do. And there's my um, sign that shows how fabulous you are that I'm pretty sure everybody on this webinar can read all of that. Um, all attendees will receive a certificate for one hour of professional development. That will come to the email that you used to register for this presentation. And you will um, be take a look in your spam just in case. And I'm gonna tell you, I went rogue. The system was set up for getting it the day after. You all should be getting your certificate an hour from now. So look for it. If you don't find it, it says by June 25th, but if you don't have your certificate by tomorrow and you've looked in your spam and you have asked good critical questions like where else could this be and you've looked for it and you can't find it, then send an email um, to the PDN Gmail account and we'll make sure you get taken care of. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the Excellence site um, in a couple of days and that's it for today, folks. Thank you for spending an hour with me. Thank you for all that you do with your students. There's my contact information. If I can um, help you in any way, please reach out to me or any of the PDN members. We're all here to help you and to assist you. And um, again, thanks everybody. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for stepping up for your students.